Yeah. All right, let's jump in. I am your very short-lived host. My job is only to get us started and hand over to our actual hosts. But I do want to thank folks for coming today to the second in our conversations about All In. First, what is All In? Um, it's a new film that Big Picture put out uh, right before the turn of the year, uh, featuring a number of Big Picture schools uh, in California uh, who talked about their journey, discovering Big Picture, getting the community involved, and then going deeply into what it means to become a Big Picture school. Um, today is the second part of that three-part conversation where we are going to dive into that sort of community gathering experience. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, for much of the meeting, we'll ask attendees to uh, keep their mics muted just to eliminate any background noise. There will be times we'll have a chance to engage um, and certainly want to come on mic at that point, but, but most part, keep your mic muted. Um, you're also encouraged to use the gallery view on Zoom. Um, that's going to help you have a better experience. I have put all of our speakers on Spotlight. Um, so that shouldn't cause any difficulty for you all, but it is a, a good idea to start on gallery mode. You might also wish to uh, use the option that says hide non-video participants, just so like you don't sort of get the, the Brady Bunch feel of the whole thing. And then there's a difference between spotlighting and pinning. What I've done is spotlighted our presenters so that you're seeing everyone who's presenting. You also have the ability on your end to pin specific presenters. Uh, frankly, I wouldn't recommend that because I'd love you to see everybody on your screen at the same time. Um, but that's about what's in our control versus what's in your control. We're talking about a 15 minute film today, but today we're only talking about a five minute segment. But if you haven't had a chance to watch the film yet, you can see it in its entirety in two places. It's hosted on the Big Picture website at bigpicture.org um, and also on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash BP learning. Um, so if you had a chance to watch it yet, Please do. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll watch a five minute segment today. Um, but I want to go ahead and invite you to the next pieces of, of the webinar series. Two weeks for today, from today on Thursday, March 23rd, we're going to talk about the last segment of the film um, going all in, right? You have discovered Big Picture, you've brought your community together, and then you said, let's do it. Um, that's the third part of the conversation. And then we're going to try something special as a fourth part, which would be about a month from today, where um, we want to give folks this sort of idea that even though we focused on these, these schools in California, their experience is, is not unique to them, right? So we'll invite some leaders from schools in Nashville, New York, Philadelphia to reflect on the film and, and talk about some, how some of the themes resonate with their own experiences. Um, okay, I'm almost done talking. The last part I get to do before we start Definitely the film is to announce the amazing folks who have joined us. Um, Anne, are you letting folks in in the meantime? I would appreciate if you could do that. Um, Can you make student sure from Big Picture this? Ukiah. Mercy, I think you actually graduated already, but uh, Mercy is here today. And I should also mention we have another uh, student as well, Susie. Hi, Susie. I'm sorry. I already told her. I did not create a nice looking slide for Susie, but Susie has also joined us today. Um, moving from Susie to Susan. Susan Nystrom. Welcome, um, North Bay Med Academy. Um, Shannon Johnson, hello, Shannon, also from North Bay Met. Um, Holly, my colleague from the Big Picture Learning Native American Initiative, among other things. Uh, Tor, Tor, welcome um, from Marcy Becerra Academy. I think I got that right. If not, um, my bad. Um, Armando, also had the great pleasure of working very closely with Armando in the past as well. Armando is one of our hosts today. He's also uh, one of the many one of the many things in his um, responsibilities is working with the Big Picture Learning Native American Initiative. Holly and Armando, if I forget, please take some time toward the end of the presentation to shout out a lot of the sort of opportunities for learning about that initiative toward the tail end of the presentation. Would love that. Um, and then Dana, <laughs> Dana Jones. Dana was a panelist. Conversation one, and it slipped into the host duties for conversation two. Dana, thank you for joining us today. Okay, so um, one thing we're going to do now before we uh, jump into the conversation is sort of as a way to introduce you to what we're going to talk about. And then, and also a further introduction to some of our panelists is we're going to show you the middle segment of the film. It's about five minutes long. So bear with me as I stumble through the share screen function. Um, Making sure as Chris is sound. doing as Chris is doing that. Yeah. Can you make sure my panelists and 
um, participants, can you, as you're doing this, we're going to do breakouts right after. So if you can really think about like one question that pops up for you and we can use those for the panelists, but also a one like moment that kind of stands out to you. So you guys are going to have a, a little bit after this to do a breakout and have a discussion um, before we hop into our panel. So one question, one standout moment. All right. Okay, so this is all in uh, middle section. Here we go. Everything about it looks completely different. If you just like put all that, what you think of education is on a table and just look at it and go, wow, that's, yeah, this is what I know. I'm familiar with this. Now flip that table upside down. When they come in to coach, they ask you a whole bunch of questions. It feels as the professional, like you're not supposed to ask me questions. You're supposed to give me stuff. I want a map. I want some documents. Give me a binder. They continue to, in a supportive way, ask what your interests are as a teacher and the outcomes you want. The advisors receiving that coaching connect to what's happening. Instead of feeling like you want a binder, you're starting to feel, this is how I'm supposed to be. This is how this works. You have your exhibitions coming up, right? Mm -hmm. For me, the exhibition is I start to think about all the things I've done. Nice. It's more of a for me thing. I just have a knowledge of all the things I've already done and learned. That's, so that's great. Nice. When we need to do something to change, we need to convince people to do it. To convince people, we need to believe and we need to make sure that is the right thing. Connie was just like, yes, let's do this, let's change. But she wanted to make sure the whole staff was on board first. It was unlearning a lot of stuff for us. Having big picture coaches really helped us have a really good understanding of what it's like to be an advisor and to be a school leader, ensuring that what we were doing was in the students' best interest. There were certain people that were like, you're going to be an advisor because you have a really good relationship with students or you're a really positive person and I think that's going to be something that's going to be important or you're an adventurer and, and students love that kind of thing. I think a lot of the first year is uh, establishing vision, guiding values, and recognizing when tradition's gravity is pulling us back toward what we've known. Where shall we start? Stop. Start at the top. I think the secret of big picture is to make the kids understand that they believe they're an asset. It's amazing as an advisor how little time it takes engaging in that asset conversation so we spend a lot for of that young person to start to see possibilities instead of barriers and limits. Looking at the student with what they bring to the table, the positives in their life. To throw out the model of reminding a student who's chronically tardy hey, you're late today. And just being able to say to this student, I'm so glad you're here, let's get started. For me, it was a relief to approach them with an idea of curiosity. I thought to myself, this doesn't cost any money. This is just me working on how I deal with students. For being here, Ryan and Summer, Summer Shadow Day has moved to 10.30. Okay. Um, apparently one of her chickens got murdered. Oh no, so, that's today. gruesome. <laughs> I mean, life on a farm, right? Boxes yeah. get in there and that happens. Getting students out into internships is a huge focus of what we do. If you can give students LTIs, learning through interest, internships, have mentors that support them, these students start to build social equity. They're getting out into the community as a necessary component of their learning. Once I got the internship, it was like a switch that they turned on and it kind of just helped me, <laughs> helped me not everywhere now. Students sometimes aren't so hot on their coursework, but if they're in a good internship, it turns everything around. I get to really be part of the community. I go out and I do general contracting, and my mentor, he works with a lot of nonprofits in the area, and it's really nice being able to, have to like effectively help people. I'm like turning back on their heat. There aren't a lot of adults in the community who don't value electric, engaged youth who share an interest with them. It really was Dana who said, we just need to get a couple kids and get them out. Our students aren't really getting this and we have never experienced it. One day we just said, you know what, go for it. In this case, it was a student that loved cattle. We connected him with Santa Rosa Junior College School Farm, and he was working with cattle. We had another guy. He got an internship at a fire department. It was the, 
the two of them going out and all the other students going, wait a minute, I want to do that too, that got the momentum going. And so by the second year, we really felt like we were a big picture school. So just thinking about valuing math, what does that even look like? Why would you appreciate math? It's about how you're using it within your area of interest and how like it might apply. I see your smile there and I love it because I smile when I think about that too. It's more of a conversation and something that evolves over time than like a one-time test. We had to go to the board and say, we want to keep doing this. And I was watching the board and they're not getting it. There was one board member that says, you know, maybe we could like let you have it another, you know, maybe five years. No, I need to talk to you from the heart. I said, do it for the students and it passed. One of the biggest takeaways for me is just what it looks like in practice for these design principles, how they're implemented one school at a time in the same way that it's one student at a time. <laughs> Big picture learning is contagious. We love having the other schools come to visit us. Having an opportunity to network across space and time. Helping each other with different tactics. It's different every year and it's different with every set of kids. I reached out to another English teacher at another Big Picture school. He helped me, he gave me ideas. I've gotten ideas from Rhode Island and from LA and from Washington. We all believe in this work, so we all want to help each other. For a I think I forgot to um, issue the warning. This film may contain references to chicken murder. So sorry for everybody about failing to do that. Um, just a reminder, Anne's prompt as we go into breakout rooms was to talk to one another about a question for, that you might have that resonates. And if there was a quote that stuck out, you can discuss that as well. Um, just so our panelists know, we're gonna, I'm gonna mix things up a little bit this week and shoot the panel into the breakouts as well, just to make sure that we fill enough rooms, if that's okay. All right, so um, I'll send the breakouts now, and here we go. If you have some questions that you'd like to have the panel ask, um, Armando and Dana are going to be our hosts for, and facilitators for the panel, but I will be watching the chat, and I would love to call that out um, and send anything uh, forward for them. So as Chris spotlights it, I'm just going to pass it over to them um, to get to jump us into our panel discussion. Yeah, great. Thank you, Ann. Uh, welcome, everybody, again. Excited to have this panel discussion and everything. Also, just super honored to uh, facilitate this. So shout out to Holly for thinking that I'm good at things. Um, so question for uh, the panel. Um, I, I actually would, would think this would be a good question for Susan to start off with. Uh, what stakeholders were hardest to bring on board and what worked to get them on board? Yeah, that was a, that's a hard question. Um, I can honestly say that the, the hardest stakeholders were uh, educators, um, in particular um, colleagues outside of our arena. So at the comprehensive settings, as well as um, the board. Um, we did have a superintendent that got it. And I think that was because we had a couple of really good advocates in our team. One of them was the IT director who is brand new and very, um, very quiet, but assertive and relentless. And um, I also had on, on my little team, um, a vice principal at the comprehensive high school who was a friend as well as a colleague who was, I think doing a lot of things behind the scenes that, that helped as well. And, and as a trio, and then of course my team itself, my, my, my uh, staff um, worked very hard, but yeah, I would say that, that, um, that the educators were probably the hardest to convince at, at, at the beginning. Thank you. Would anybody else like to add on to what Susan said? 
I just thought it was, I remember being in a, a breakout group in our first training for big picture. Um, I think it was in the summer or right before school started and sitting next to the su superintendent and hearing him say it was okay for us to treat one student at a time. I was like, oh my God, I've been waiting to hear this my whole career. And that, that was, that was the coolest thing. Totally the coolest thing, like permission instead of forgiveness was like, yes. I would have to say, um, you know, I agree with Susan. It seemed like the educators were, I think, the hardest to push things past. Um, we had a visit uh, when we were still, like, trying to figure out how to put the boots on the ground. And we had a visit from another uh, school. And they came to us and they were like, this doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, why are the students playing, you know, doing these cooperative type activities when, you know, it's curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. And we were... You know, we tried and we were frustrated as to let them know like, hey, well, this is, you know, what we think is good is, is letting go of that baggage of I have to I have to learn something and where they get to share their experiences with us and people didn't get it. And Susan and I just looked at each other and were like, I guess they just don't get it. It's like, you know, you can only talk to people so much about something and if they're not getting it or they're begging you to convince them that it's better than what they are already experiencing, then you know you're just kind of stuck in there. So it's it's a very uh, weird thing. But um, Susan, I wanted to ask you to kind of um, who were your your first partners like outside of the school that helped you kind of um, get us moving in the right direction. Well, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, as we started to progress, I, I have to say that there were some parents um, that had the right mindset and led me to believe that, you know, this is, this is the right way to go. Um, and so that certainly was helpful. Um, the the support from big picture was, was I think um, the, the most incredible thing because, you know, it was like, you know, we initially said, well, we're thinking about this. And then once we kind of said, yeah, we want to do it. And it was just like, we had overwhelming support. Um, uh, so much that it was like overload. Um, in our community, um, there was, um, certainly a few kind of uh, businesses and, and people in the community that are like, yeah, we really need this. And I can't really put my you know, finger on exactly who they were, but it, it was a pulse that I could feel um, in terms of conversations with people. Um, you know, it wasn't like the Rotary Club as a unit said, yeah, but there was like a couple of people that would go, yeah, this is really a neat idea. You need to do this. Um, so it, it's it's really hard to name names for me at this point in time, but um, there were varied people people at the layers of of community that um, that I think came into play. Uh, parents came into play, and then of course students started to come into play once they kind of figured out what it was. At first, they're all like the rest of us, they're like, oh, what is this? Give me a handout. Um, but um, students too started, you, you started to see leadership kinds of things starting to happen. Those kids that wanted to make that jump um, started to play and all of that gave us momentum. I wanna chime in too, um, what's resonating is, as I'm hearing people talk, we have a key administrator from our DO that's like our bulldog, right? It was my principal the first year here and now in year three, we've had a consistent, I think you have to have someone in the DO who's fighting for you all the time, talking to people, who's really skilled with people. I think you do need those community members, but for me, the biggest linchpin so far has been bringing that administrator and those community members with a couple skeptics into an exhibition to see a parent cry tears of joy. And when a young person like Susie in that video talks about explicitly 
owning all of her learning. And she literally goes through this thing and look at all I'm doing. And then her parent for the first time in years is beaming with pride, loving school, talking about how Susie's liking school. If you can create that perfect storm, an administrator that sees a parent cry, and then the teachers who had the kids that I have now, for instance, the SPED teacher who had this young person who struggled and struggled because they just had to keep doing assignments and assignments and assignments, and they see them come into this model and now go from sullen and disengaged to engaged and excited. A few teachers, a few DO, that Rotary Club people, and then once you get parents and the students, because then the students, our campus supervisor brought a person who wants might be coming next year over, and I had two students run to that kid, be like, no, you got to do it. Like, this is super cool. And once that happens, and I think at every big picture school, we're on the high school campus, and every single solitary day, I can count one more kid from the traditional high school that comes to hang out in our space with the kids that go to MBA. So now we have 35 kids in our program, but we have 70 kids on this campus that come into our space and get comfortable. So lastly, campus supervisors, custodians are huge assets. You get them on your side too. So there you go, thanks. Great, thanks, uh, thanks y'all. Um, I think something that was, that stood out to me, it still stands out to me, right? Um, but I feel like there was an instance, you know, where an advisor was talking about where you have to believe in, you know, the change that you're trying to make, right? And the things that you're trying to do when you're, um, you know, creating a new system and operating a new system, like a uh, big picture, right? So that switch is really difficult for some folks, right? Because it's like, I'm just going to revert back to what I knew, right? And what I know, right? And so this next question uh, is from Mercy, right? Um, especially as a really dope young person, Right. How did you work collaboratively with advisors and administrators to kind of create a collective vision for your school? And um, yeah, can you like talk about like that process? Yeah, um, the best part about Big Picture is that the advisors are so open and willing to experience anything with you. So when I was a student here, my learning plan, my vision was not to be a paraprofessional, was not to be in the school system. I was looking more into social work and the medical fields, but the way that Big Picture is and the advisors are, they're just so driven to help you explore yourself and to learn who you are as a person that, you know, they just, they shine lights on areas and situations that you wouldn't even take into consideration, right? Like, I know I loved working with youth. I know I love working with my community, but I didn't know exactly how I was gonna get there. I was very back and forth in careers and in paths that I wanted to do, you know? And I was just grateful enough to where Big Picture and the school system was just like, took me under their wing. It was like, this is what we're gonna help you do. And this is what, you're gonna thrive in. And so I was very lucky to have the staff truly fully support me, whether it was advisors or, you know, um, our uh, campus security here, he was a very, very big support system for me that helped me see what I was capable of doing as a human. And so just the community that Big Picture builds is just strong and it's beautiful. And it's like a family to where you get more support from your actual family, you know, and then you make connections with other schools. And it's just, it's just really a big family and they really help you as an individual and they don't shut down ideas, you know, like I'd go to the advisor I had multiple times and be like, I want to do this, but then I want to do this, but actually now I want to do this. And there was never a time where they were like, uh, maybe you shouldn't, or like, oh, do you really think so? They were always like, all right, what can we do to help you get to that point? What can we do to help you see if that's truly what you want to do? And it's just really impactful. And you have to really be open to the opportunities and to the opportunity, well, the opportunities and the community too because a lot of it is just community outreach and you have to be open and willing to reach out to the community to talk to the advisors to complete what you want to complete in life that's 
That's awesome. Thank you, Mercy. Susie, what was your experience um, in the beginnings of creating a big picture school and how did you participate? Um, I'd say um, it's been a big change, that's for sure, from going somewhere to being here. I, um, I've been here for a while and it's, it's more, I'm comfortable now, of course, but when I first got here, it was very confusing, very, what, what am I going to do now? What, what, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do this? Especially since I got here during COVID, it was, it was just all scrabbled the very beginning of this school going towards big picture. So I got here when I just started and I was kind of trying to figure things out a lot of like Mercy said, a lot of like, how do we get you there instead of, are you sure? A lot of like, I've had a lot of changes in the um, career paths that I want to do. The Leaving to Learns are very helpful. And so, yeah. I want to say something. I think Susie, oh, excuse me. Hi, I think Madonna. Susie brought up a good point. Um, that uh, when a big picture school first starts, um, the student leaders don't know what's going on either. And so it, it takes a little while. And then once you get your school going, then you start having students that can model. Um, but it is really challenging, isn't it, Susie, at the beginning where nobody really kind of knows what's going on. We used to say what we're building the train and the tracks with you guys and none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> Madonna, did you have something you wanted to say? Sorry, uh, just what Mercy was saying about the support. I, I think that's like really um, as a mom, as a uh, someone in the community to to hear that from somebody, you know, the the youth. It's it's really important, and I and I definitely know that to be true for my biological kids. When I had them in public school, I for every new teacher they got, um, and this was very hard because it's so much change every year or semester, whatever. But I had to make sure that those teachers knew that my kids were leaders, and I had to humanize my children to each and every teacher with my kids um, that I was guardian to that went to big picture met, I didn't have to do that. They they already were supporting Rayon and Adrian. Um, and I just wish that every school did that because it would help the, like the whole human race. Like, so uh, Mercy, thank you for saying that, um, honey. Um, it, it's it's really nice to hear. Thank, thank you for letting me speak. So one of the questions that we got in our uh, breakout rooms was like, how do you go about changing the mindset of the final result, right? How do we as big picture people, you know, or even as like changing student mindset of, I have to get a grade and the grade has to be X. And that means that I am therefore qualified to go into uh, the world. So, um, Maybe we'll start with Susan and then kind of whoever wants to jump in, jump in. It's like, so how do you like break away, chip away or, you know, free yourself, like find the handcuff keys to get you away from um, that idea of transcripts and grades and that the data has to be there in a measurable manner. Otherwise, we don't exist. Well, well, for me. Um... You know, I, I never taught and was a big picture advisor. I was an administrator. So I come in it with it from an administrative point of view, but I did have, you know, a lot of education behind me. And part of it was being a, a CTE teacher. Um, and I knew that, that academic strength, though very nice to have in, in terms of academics in school, is not necessary to be successful and happy and even um, you know, financially successful in life. And um, so I always preach that to students. I always said, you know, let's see, you know, and you know, C's average. Okay, well, you're average. That's good. Yeah. You know, now what do you want to do? 
Um, so I, I've always had the mentality that it's great to get good grades, but it, it wasn't the most important thing. The biggest culprit in that was the parents, um, you know, um, especially of younger students that, um, you know, still had this illusion that their, their students had to have super high grades. So I had to spend a lot of time with parents uh, helping them to see the success of their students, especially with big picture, they started to see it, that grades weren't what it was all about. It was make it, having their, their student be happy and successful and doing things that they had never seen them do before. Um, and um, that was a grand thing. And then you, you also had your peers, your colleagues that were still in that a, B, C, D, E, F, you know, it's, it's like, no, 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 you know, we want students to be confident and know what they're going to do and, and go and do it. And whether that's school or career or both, that's fine. Um, so it was more attitudinal that, you know, you need to be happy in life and you need to figure out what you want to do and explore and big picture fit that really well. Or did you want to comment on that from an advisor perspective? You're muted. Ask me the question one more time, Dana. I was totally engaged with Susan's reply. <laughs> How do you break free of the the um, was it say you know the the roadblocks of the the final result, the transcript, the grades, the um, you know, the data that the educational system seems to want to drill into our students and to us as educators. I really learned very early I wasn't going to change an educator's opinion about that. There's no speech. There's nothing I'm going to say. For me, the only thing that changed that is getting in and doing the work with one student. And then from that one student, go to the next student. Honestly, the hardest thing to do when I got to Healdsburg was work in one student at a time because it felt like I was working with seven kids that were really getting it and doing a lot and 23 that I just wasn't doing enough for, but focus on the positive. So for me, replicating success with students and then bringing in and controlling the narrative, sharing that narrative with stakeholders every time there's a success. And it just starts with one and then it goes to two and pretty soon you're at five and then you have an advisory and then pretty soon you're Windsor and <laughs> you feel like you can make sense of it and it's working and you have bones and structures and you never really won the argument with anyone who's got 25 years of brain training in, you know, the older we get, the more fixed we get. I kind of think generally, so I don't try to convince people. I just work with kids. That's what I'd have to say to that, I think. What I've noticed is that when students are actually able to do what they really love doing, their achievement goes up tremendously and they're happier. And, you know, I, if I get out of their way, I'd say it all the time and just let them do what they really are passionate about. It's going to be way better than anything I dreamed up. And it's going to be part of what they're supposed to be getting in the standards. You know, they're, it's helping them become the people they want to become. Um, and I laugh at all the kids that were like, mediocre students but what their passion was was something that was working with their hands and my goodness they're out earning me already you know a couple years out of high school great uh this next one is particularly for our two students um who are on the panel um but then you know other folks like holly i would like for you to also answer because i think you have some good insight uh, so Susie and Mercy, how do y'all feel as young people? Um, how do you feel like you were authentically engaged and involved in shaping your school? And then with that question, who do you also feel is a part of your community? You want me to go, Susie, or do you want to? You can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how to answer this exactly from my point of view, 
like I guess for me was now as a student because I feel like I did a lot within the community and so I feel like I've always just been a part of it but um a way that I could say at my school um right now currently students decided to make a mural on campus and it's an indigenous mural that um indigenous students that are working on that the principal was just like okay go ahead have this wall do what you want to do on it and so over the past two three months these beautiful ladies have been on this wall expressing themselves with their community with us just taking their time to put it the way that they want to put it and you know they decided that they want to have an unveiling event, but they also want to have Pomo dancers and Aztec dancers come and do a celebration and bless the mural that they're bringing to the school. And so in ways like that, it's very beautiful to see. I'm very proud of those girls. They're doing an amazing job. And, you know, in that type of way, and the community is very, very evolved. We're blessed enough to have multiple tribes around us that want to work with youth, that want to work with um, the students here. And so um, we have a lot of tribal resources as well as uh, community resources, but mainly tribal, which I love. You know, we have this one tribe out here, Penaliville. They are out here multiple times a week doing white bison trainings, doing workshops with the students, teaching them um, elderberry medicine they came and did yesterday. You know, they're very, very involved and it's, it's, it's very entwined at my school and I love it. Um, actually, that's, um, it's funny since we're kind of doing something similar with the indigenous and we have a mur mural that's gonna go up in town. And one thing is we're a really small school, not many students, not many staff, but it kind of bring, it brings us closer. You know, we're like a family, a community. We're really engaged with each other, take care of each other, that kind of thing. And I think that that's just like, it just makes it a lot better. It's like magical, you know? And we've got this, um, a, the break room, we call it a cafe, but it's kind of where things tend to happen. Um, it's just very en engaging and, Everyone is helping each other out, doing things, getting out to the community, trying to help each other. It's just, yeah. But I don't know what kind of role I play in this school. I, it's, I just kind of sit back, but I do, I try and engage as much as I can. So, you know, yeah. Thanks, Susie. I love this question. Thank you both for sharing that. And, you know, I work with the Native American Initiative and I work in all the schools we're talking about. And um, all these all these schools are on Pomo land and Pomo, the Pomo people are some of the, the world's renowned basket weavers. And so when I think about this question, I think about the way Mercy and Susie are both talking and I think about building a school together and I think about it like a basket. And what I hear you saying, both of the students that just shared, is that they're weaving who they are into that basket so that it's not, ex, it's not, you don't have to leave who you are and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you get to bring who you are into the school. And so, you know, I'm hearing two different examples. Like, you know, I know I worked with Armando when he was a high school student at Highline and you know, he was part of hiring staff. He was, um, you know, both for the school and um, for the Title VI Indian Education Program Manager for the district, you know, and there are all these like very specific ways that he was actively, you know, working with staff and district employees to build the school. But I also just really love hearing about the ways that student culture, like the culture of the school is influenced by the students who show up there and by the the open door for the, the families and the tribal communities and whoever, you know, for all students that I think, you know, as someone that works with the Native American Initiative, what I, what I've heard Native community partners say is like, it's the first place where they feel like they're, they're welcome to bring 
their culture and their language into the schools, which makes them who they are. And that instead of um, thinking about, you know, non-Western ways of understanding the world as less than academic or, or not relevant, instead, you get to um, bring that knowledge, not just to the native students, but to all the students. Anyway, I just, uh, and I think those are all ways that the schools are shaped from the beginning by the students and the communities that they are there to serve. I wanted to make a comment that, um, you know, Mercy and Susie are an example of, of what a, a big picture concept is all about. And here they are online you know, sharing to a national and it could be international audience. Um, they were involved in a film that's up on YouTube. And I, I'm not so sure if, if, if they necessarily would have those opportunities if they were, you know, struggling in a comprehensive school, trying to turn in that handout um, and, you know, make it to school every day and, and, and do those things. So, um, I think you guys are great examples. Um, and even though you don't recognize yourself as leaders, you really are. And um, that's really exciting and what it's all about. I have a couple of comments. Um, one kind of going back to what Holly was saying, you know, there is a difficulty in convincing people to think something different. And we got that with COVID, right? And I remember seeing a cartoon before COVID even happened where like, oh, the classrooms haven't changed since 1920, right? Is that kids are in rows, they, you know, somebody's in the front professing and then, you know, the kids are taking furious notes and then giving it back in a test. And that, that mentality was hard for people to break. And obviously COVID was like, yeah, throw that crap out the door. And then we were able to learn in very different ways. And I think our big picture students really rose to the occasion of saying, oh, I know how to double down on this. And we saw some amazing projects that came out of COVID from our students. Um, but I have to go back and say that with all the resistance from the parents and from different educators and everything else, the native and indigenous community provided none. Um, the minute we said we were doing this, they were like, we're on. And I think it's because the comprehensive setting isn't always welcoming and or acknowledging their existence. And um, because we were doing something different and because it was the, their student was at the center of the educational experience, they embraced us. And I, we wouldn't be here, honestly, if it wasn't for Holly connecting us, if it wasn't for us, you know, really realizing who our true supporters were, are, were, all that. And, um, you know, I just wanna say that how grateful I am because of the fact that no matter what happens, our native community is behind us. And I appreciate that. So thank you guys. Definitely, I just think like, as we uh, wrap up, you know, that community is in, intrinsically important to the model of big picture learning, right? Um, my parents were never really invested in school until like they had to come to see what work I was doing and not doing, right? And then also having conversations with, you know, Holly and my other mentors within the community about how important it was for me to get reintroduced um, to like my culture and everything, right? And also just how to incorporate that into my learning, right? Uh, and I think that this particular part of the video was always really uh, impactful for me because I realized so much how important community was to me at Big Picture, right? And I realized that doing work with Holly, right? And that's specifically why I came back to White Center and I'm working in White Center and back in my neighborhood, right? Because the neighborhood is so much more important to me than like, um, you know, selling out and making $100,000 at Amazon to do some stupid diversity work with people who don't really care, you know, whereas like I'm doing real work with students who are, you know, my little homies, little homies, or like my cousins or whatever, right? It's so, like, I think the impact of community and big picture is so ingrained into us as students. Um, and we can see that also reflective with like Mercy going back and working at her school and being hella dope and everything too, you know, so yeah. Am I going to throw it to Chris or Ann? I don't know which one of y'all is going to wrap up. You can throw it to me. I'll take it. But um, before I wrap, and because you all segue so nicely, um, 
Holly and Armando, knowing that in, in the post email I send out, I'll, I'll shoot the link tree that you all have created. But if you want to give a quick plug to the, the greater work of the BPL Native American Initiative, I'm, the space is yours to do so, please do so. Thank you. And, and thanks for uh, all of the, you know, you know, this whole conversation is just, it's like we said, it's all interconnected with the work we do at the Native American Initiative. And these are all schools that I've been working with in Northern California. And it's, it's, it's so helpful for me to hear the students talk about um, how this has been meaningful to them and the staff. Thank you, Dana, for that. And um, the Big Picture Learning Native American Initiative works, one, to make sure that every Native student has access to culture and language learning as an integral part of their learning, you know, um, and that the Big Picture Learning Design Principles really um, make that possible in an authentic way. Um, and then the second piece is making sure that every single student learns about native people from native people and really it gets to benefit like you know from native perspectives and understandings of the world and we do that in lots of different ways um, we coach our schools um sometimes you know for really specific or or very broad um you know coaching goals that are often multi-year um our advisory board is comprised of students you know former students like armando our community partners, Madonna, who I don't know if she's still on the call, is definitely involved. And um, there's lots of ways that we support schools, both right here in Northern California, but also across the network and internationally. And right now we're doing two virtual monthly calls. One is building healthy relationships with Native students and families. Um, and Mercy and I are co-facilitating that and helping schools and, and individuals build out some real, like, healthy indicators like how do you know how you you know how do you know either as an advisor or as a school or as a school leader and then we also have an international indigenous youth talking circle that mondo is um facilitating we've got uh indigenous identified students from uh from all from all over really we've had on onondaga students from our lafayette school and we've got students pomo students tulalip students and we're hoping to to pull in uh, our Australia, Hawaii, Kenya, and New Zealand students soon. Um, so you can uh, email me if you're interested in connecting, and it's just BP, I'll put it in the chat. It's BPLNAI, Big Picture Learning Native American Initiative, at Big Picture Learning, or yeah, yeah, Big Picture Learning dot org. Um, and, uh, you know, please reach out. We'd love to support you in any way that we can. Thanks right. for that time, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And I wanted to just conclude um, one of my jobs as chief communication officers is to uh, plug, plug other things. Um, so um, as we conclude, and you don't have to write any of this down, I'll send an email out to folks. There are a couple of three things I want you to know. There's a B there's a uh, all in resource guide that acts as sort of a compendium to the, um, the video itself and I'll send that to folks. Uh, a reminder that we we're, we have two more webinars to conclude this series and they're happening every other week. So I'll send folks a link to that. And then uh, finally, I want folks to know, particularly those that are familiar with the Big Picture Learning Network, registration for our annual conference, Big Bang, is now open and you can learn more about that at bigpicture.org. Um, I talked about this at the last webinar. Um, Susan, you weren't on, but I quoted you. The very first um, section of the video, uh, a quote, someone asks you, how's it going? And you said it's going awful or some version of that, right? Um, but that's a prelude to the very end of the 15 minute video, which is like a, a collage of young people smiling and just being joyful. So that's where we'll get, that's where, that's where the journey takes you. And I'm excited to host our third conversation two weeks from now. Um, so I hope folks can join us for that as well. Um, for now, enjoy your day, whether it's still morning for you or now afternoon. Um, but thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you to our attendees. Really appreciate your time today. That's all. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you, everyone. Good to see you, Susan. Bye, everybody.